Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. Today's event is being recorded, so if you missed any or all of the event, you will be able to listen to it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for either of the panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. We'll take as many questions as we can near the end of today's webinar. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around, see if you're one of our three lucky winners. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Distributed Transactions with CockroachDB on Red Hat OpenShift. Our speakers today are Keith McClellan, who is Senior, or I'm sorry, who's Director of Solutions Engineering at CockroachDB, and Jim Walker, who is VP of Marketing at CockroachDB. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me today. Hello, how are you? Uh, and thanks for having us, Charlene. Um, we are excited to be here today. We thought awesome. we'd throw we thought we'd throw two pictures of ourselves up there so people know who's actually talking, um, and just update you on who we are. Yeah, Keith does represent our sales engineering org, and then I'm um, actually vice president of product marketing here um, at Cockroach Labs. And we wanted to thank uh, the team at Red Hat for inviting us to do this uh, today, and and for the DevOps.com team to for 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 hosting the webinar. Right. So welcome, Keith. Thank you, and thank you, uh, DevOps team and, and Red Hat for for hosting us. Cool. Uh, Charlene, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we jump in? I just wanted to let you know that the floor is yours. I was just going to put myself on mute. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so just if there are questions along the way, please do use the, the question panel. We'll be monitoring those. Uh, Keith and I are happy with any and all questions. Uh, we love questions. So, And I uh, hope we'll try to make this as interactive and as, as uh, lively as possible. Uh, hopefully it's not, you know, too early or too late for you, so we'll, we'll keep it lively. So this whole world of, of uh, the way that we kind of build and, and deliver applications, uh, I feel is going through some sort of transformation. And, and at, the, at the core, at the bottom of a lot of this fundamental transformation that's happening um, is a technology called Kubernetes. And Kubernetes really being this kind of unique distributed architecture, which you know is kind of you know some Google exhaust, right? Google had a backend system called Borg that basically runs all their backend, um, you know, basically the backend of Gmail and uh, uh, Drive and, uh, you know, all, all the applications that you think of today, it's all one big set of systems. Um, and that's all run off of something called Borg. Now, when they open sourced that and created a version for everybody else to use, um, you know, there's an acronym called Google Infrastructure for Everyone, Giphy, I think it was called back then. Um, you know, they released something called Kubernetes. And, you know, over the past few years, we've seen Kubernetes really kind of, you know, be adopted across the board um, in all types of organizations, either large or small. Um, and really, you know, Kubernetes is really there to orchestrate compute across, you know, uh, lots of different applications as we containerize applications. It allows you to scale things up and down and then ensures that your applications are always going to be up and running, um, your services that you have, right? Um, However, there's a bit of an issue with Kubernetes, and it really goes back to the way it was designed and what it was actually uh, created for. Uh, and that really is around data and databases. You know, when I was first introduced to Kubernetes, I, I got really confused. I'm like, okay, great, that's wonderful, but like these ephemeral workloads, where do they store data? Like what happens, right? And so, you know, I got introduced to persistent volumes and PV claims and all these things and how storage works. Um, but I really got confused around, okay, that's that's cool, but I'm a developer. What about the database? Like that, that's great. Like what about the database? Because a database can't really be ephemeral, or can it? Right. And and so when we think about data in a in a Kubernetes environment, and we think about kind of the the premise and the core principles that go behind Kubernetes, you know, does it make sense to run a database uh, within the whole architecture in the system of you know Kubernetes pods and these whatnot, right? So. Um, there's, there's some just some issues, some fundamental issues when we think about the database in particular. A, I just talked about like the ephemeral workload. Um, 
B, and, and, and more importantly, is what happens when we go global? Um, what happens when you know, systems and applications are available all over the planet? And how do we have a database that's gonna scale to meet the needs of people all over the planet? Most notably from a latency point of view. Um, you know, if we're gonna have people ask, accessing clusters that are all over the place, even if they aren't connected, if, even if we don't have federated Kubernetes clusters, which is a wholly other concept, you know, how are we actually going to get that data in all those different places to address some of these latency concerns? If I have a user that's accessing an application that's in Sydney, but the database lives in Raleigh, and we're expecting to get the same, you know, performance latency issues or latency expectations to Sydney as I am to New York when the database sits in Raleigh, what, what does that mean for our end users? Um, you know, in this, in this day and age where, you know, 100 milliseconds is, seems like a lifetime for many people, um, they drop off, right? Now, that said, you know, Google actually solved this way back. Um, they solved it with something called Spanner, which they used internally, and they used it basically as a transactional database. They had big table at the time, they had a bunch of other ways of actually moving and getting lots of data all over the place. But from a transactional point of view, uh, which is kind of the, you know, the core of our OLTP workloads that we see in organizations, uh, they still struggle with it. And so they built something called Spanner. Um, and we see lots of organizations just try to build something from the ground up to do this. Now, I'll fast forward, CockroachDB is basically um, an extension of kind of what Kubernetes and Spanner is all about, right? So let, let me just, um, let me, before I get back into CockroachDB, let me just level set really quick on Kubernetes, a really quick kind of fundamental overview, right? This is all based off of containers, right? A container basically is abstraction of the OS, so an application can basically run anywhere. We, we containerize our applications, so we can pick them up and drop them into anything. It's gonna fit into these different orchestration engines. I mean, they're named a container, just like you think about containers on ships, but we standardize containers on ships so that we can move them all over the planet, right? They're gonna fit on, you name the ship, it's gonna fit on a Chinese ship, a Russian ship, an American ship, right? And so think of those as kind of the orchestration platforms and Kubernetes being kind of the standard in that and OpenShift being the leader um, for enterprise kind of Kubernetes, right? And so you gotta start with, with containers. Now, Kubernetes helps control these things. Uh, Kubernetes really comprises of a control plane, which says, okay, this is what I want my state to look at. And then these pods, and pods being basically the technology that allows us to communicate or and control basically a server and an application that's running on a box somewhere, right? It's pretty simple when you actually break it down its constituent parts. I think as a community, the Kubernetes community, I think works to almost make it more complex sometimes because there's a lot that we can do with this, but if you break it down in its core fundamental principles, it really comes down to a control plane and these pods, pods controlling these containers that are running on servers and places. And, and you know, Kubernetes is pretty standardized. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it and the ease of maintenance, uh, security, uh, integration with your current existing systems, deploying software on Kubernetes, these things are pretty difficult. And that's why things like OpenShift have come about to actually simplify these things for organizations, right? And so, when we think about it, you know, and a lot of the organizations that we deal with, they are going down the hat of using OpenShift to actually do this because it simplifies a lot of this stuff. So where I'm using Kubernetes here, you can really think about using the word Red Hat OpenShift and, and, and just throwing in a little bit more of the enterprise readiness, if you will, in terms of what, you know, these larger organizations really expect out of a software. And, you know, honestly, they, they also expect to be supported and, you know, indemnification, lots of, lots of other things. Everything that Red Hat's been amazing about for, Gosh, how, how long, Keith? It was 19, what, wait, what year was Red Hat founded? I think we're going to have to ask the panel. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to come back to that. So we just we were just going through this last week, but I mean, for years and years as an open source company, really understanding how to actually go about these things, right? And so we think about it: if we have Kubernetes and we have OpenShift and we're controlling containers and how many instances of compute we have up and running for, say it was our Get Account microservice. Basically what I'm doing here, I have a representative example. I have three services that I wanna have up and running. I have six boxes. These are servers that are in a rack, right? And basically I'm telling this, this Kubernetes cluster to say, I don't want any servers up, services up and running. Well, I, what if I want 10 blue, zero red, and zero yellow? Well, what Kubernetes is going to do is gonna spin up instances of this service. So uh, get account is that service, let's just say, it's gonna spin up 10 instances and distribute it across that cluster and it's gonna ensure those things are always running. Well, I wanna now run eight red and eight yellow. It's gonna spin those up. It's gonna evenly distribute them across the cluster, and it's gonna be, it's gonna ensure that these things are all ready to go, right? 
it's basically going to take any state that you define in the control plane and it's going to make sure that those amount of instances are running right we can scale up demands we say oh i need 12 of the blue uh, and actually 10 of the yellow so it's actually it's an easy way to scale up and down to meet demand right like and so say the get account service that is being used a whole lot you know on on on, a, on monday morning at 10 get account like the the, the we have peak expectations of that service, we could just scale that thing up and down really easy. Kubernetes could just take care of all that. Uh, and this is just three services. You know, sometimes an organization's really hundreds of services with lots of different, you know, varying different, um, you know, needs or, or demands on, on the level of compute that is needed for each one of those things. So it's just a simpler way of actually orchestrating these things. But ultimately what's really important is Kubernetes, Kubernetes actually understands when something goes down too and says, hey, look at this, you know, server number two here has gone down um, and I have to have this state of 12, seven and 10, what do I do? It decommissions those services and opens it up and starts running them on other boxes, right? And so we're insured as, a, as an organization to, that we're gonna have compute that's gonna go out there, right? And so what we're talking about here is basically this rebalancing and understanding when there's issues so that we can basically ensure that the proper level of service is gonna be delivered to our customers and the people who are accessing those applications. And that's really what this is all about. I mean, you know, we don't have to have a, a, a DevOps person or SRE basically spinning things and starting things up manually. Um, you know, they're just, they're, they're dialing, well, it's a, lot, it's a lot more difficult than this, but you know, they're dialing some knobs, turning some levers and making sure that things are on. It, you know, they're, they're basically setting etcds so certain things are actually happening in Kubernetes and it's taking care of all that on the back end, right? And so that's my simplest way of thinking through Kubernetes, right? And, and I think one of the issues here is what if one of these services, what if the, one of these containerized services was a database, right? A, you're gonna have issues like, okay, where is that thing? Well, I think we could solve that. Um, what happens when these ephemeral pods and these, these, these servers go down. What what do you do in that case? What if what if I was running you know my my SQL database on server number two in a pod and it just went away? You're going to want redundancies built into your system so that you always have access to this information. Um, what's worse is what if this stuff is actually going to run all over the world? How do you actually make sure it's available and and you're able to hit these latency things right? And so there's there's lots of different reasons why you need a distributed database on top of this overall architecture. Now, like I was talking about. You know, Red Hat OpenChef provides this enterprise-ready Kubernetes platform, which we kind of talked about. Like some of the advanced capabilities that that it provides is tremendous. And so, for us, however, um, you know, Cockroach DB presents a very unique distributed architecture for a database. So the same way that we think about pods and 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 control planes and these sort of things is the same way that we think about data in our database. Um, in fact, I think this Kubernetes use is it Paxos or Raft, you know? It uses Raft as well. In yeah. fact, etcd uses Raft. I know in multi-master etcd, these sort of things. And, and you know, we're contributing actually upstream to etcd because our implementation in Raft actually has lots of things that actually commit back into etcd, right? And so there's a protocol called Raft and we're gonna come back into that. Um, but what we use that to uh, extensive uh, power in, in our in, in our database but what we're providing is truly a distributed database where we can spin a node up anywhere we can point it at a cluster and the cluster itself is going to take care of coordin coordination of this data so that if we lose a node it knows it lost a node and needs to spin it back up same way kind of organize you know like or it needs to spin that data back up if you will we'll come back to that in a minute the same way that Kubernetes really thought about that. Or if I scale, I, I add a new node to the system, does it know that it needs to rebalance that data to balance all that data all over the place, right? And you know, we can do things like geo distribution and, and tie data to a location as well, which gets, gets really interesting when we get to these kind of you know, globally distributed clusters of information, right? And so with that, I wanna actually just take a step back. I've done a lot of talking really fast. Yes. And I wanna actually hand it over to show uh, how we actually can get started with, with CockroachDB and OpenShift. And I'm gonna, Keith's gonna start off an installation process. I'm gonna come back and give a, another quick, like two bits about CockroachDB, and then we'll get into the deeper parts of the demo, okay? Yeah, so um, we have uh, worked really closely with Red Hat team to make it as easy as possible to install CockroachDB on OpenShift. So, 
Um, this is a, uh, an OpenShift cluster that is running on my laptop. It's using the code-ready container deployment of uh, OpenShift 412, I think. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to install uh, uh, the, the operator uh, that's in Operator Hook. A couple of clicks. Um, and then, uh, so we're going to go ahead and we'll put it in the Cockroach DB namespace, which will make it nice and easy for us to find. We're going to go ahead and install that operator. Didn't take very long. Isn't that nice? Um, now, that doesn't automatically set up a Cockroach DB instance, but it's only a couple more clicks to actually go ahead and, and set that up. Um, we could change the size and whatnot. I'm not going to do that here today, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and start an environment Cockroach DB. So what we're going to get is we're going to get a set of pods that are going to go ahead and, and get things started. So right now we're waiting for the, um, the actual operator to continue to finish launching. And as soon as that goes, it is going to go ahead and start those, uh, those three pods. So that we'll have a, we'll have a three node cluster of Cockroach TV running on my laptop here. In just a, just a couple of minutes here. So in just a few clicks, you have a three node cluster up and running. And so that's the simplicity and the, the value of kind of OpenShift is getting things up and running very, very quickly. Um, lots of other stuff in OpenShift. I'm not an expert. I know lots of people who are, um, but using operators to actually do all this is such a key piece, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, what's really great about this pattern is you're guaranteed to have a high, highly resilient database on your OpenShift platform mm -hmm. in just a couple of clicks. Mm -hmm. And a database that was actually designed for basically this entire infrastructure, which is what we're gonna go through now a little bit too. Yeah, so even if, um, once this is up and running, we're gonna demonstrate what it looks like to have a pod fail while work, work is going on in the cluster. And um, we're gonna be doing that against, a, uh, I'm gonna do my best uh, sh uh, TV chef impression. We're gonna use a cluster that I provisioned out in the cloud that's uh, got nine nodes across three different data centers to, to, to show you what it really looks like to, to orchestrate this in production. Cool. I, I like to use like the, the fishing show example where the guy just pulls a fish out of the water. Uh, it was obviously from the, the grocery store. Yeah, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not going to do that, but, All right, uh, but uh, just because. All right, it's not already dead and frozen. It's, it's actually not, a real cluster. It is a real nine cluster. It's, it's, it's got nine nodes. Awesome. All right. so. Let's just, while that cluster is is spinning up, um, just so we show that all happening for you, um, I just wanted to give a little bit more detail into under the covers what's going on in CockroachDB that makes it a distributed database. Now, at the core of what we're doing, um, we use something called Raft. And if you aren't familiar with Raft, it's kind of really interesting. It's, it's actually, it's fascinating to, to, to read and understand. And it's a distributed consensus protocol. And, you know, to me, Raft and Paxos is really kind of the key drivers behind all this kind of distributed systems craziness that's going on and something that's really kind of interesting to have. And, um, you know, Raft for us, we, we use to basically distribute database within a cluster, with data within a database cluster. When we write data into CockroachDB, it's actually getting written in triplicates. We break tables down into smaller chunks. We actually break every table down into 64 megabit chunks. And each one of those, and we call that a range. And then each one of those ranges is actually written in triplicate. And we can actually distribute that data across a cluster um, for various different reasons. We're going to come back into that. But Raft is a way for us to actually make sure that we can, A, distribute that data, but B, more importantly, make sure that we have consistent transactions so that when I write data to a database, if I have three copies of it, how do I ensure that you know, I have serializable isolation? How do I know that that transaction I actually committed, I'm not getting dirty reads, I'm not getting phantom reads, not getting non-repeatable reads? And, and more importantly, how do I do that in every in every zone? How do I make, you know, what's another unique capability of Cockroach TV? How do I make every single node in a database a write node? So everything can be a gateway. Everything can be an endpoint for both reads and writes, um, which is kind of a truly unique way of thinking about a database. So you don't have like a write node and a bunch of read nodes distributed all over the world using distributed storage. It's every node within Cockroach TV is a single instance into itself, um, its single lowest atomic unit, including its own storage. And that's really why it fits very well in Kubernetes because it kind of self-function and doesn't need to have any sort of shared storage or shared kind of you know state between each one of them other than the way that it actually you know, uses gossip and raft to actually coordinate all of these different things, And right? So 
Raft is kind of the underlying kind of, you know, a lot of the underlying intelligence that goes into what we do um, within CockroachDB itself. Now, it allows us to do some really great things that align very well. When we place data into a cluster, so here's a, here's a four node cluster. You can imagine these four nodes running each of them in their own pod on Kubernetes. And this is the table. These are all dog names. And I've broken the table down into three different groups or three ranges. Uh, they're all alphabetical, and there's reasons we do that. Uh, but I, I won't. I you can actually view our architecture of a distributed database webinar where we go really deep into the architecture. But what we'll do is we can actually place data across various different nodes based on you know what we want to actually survive. This is when you think about resiliency. I want to survive a disk failure or a rack failure, or or you know I want to survive an entire AZ or data center going out or an entire region going out. We can actually distribute data. And we can control the database. Keith is going to show you how to do this on the, at the table level on um, where data is actually stored. So we can survive different failures, right? And so when we write this data, this table to the database, we're going to write the first range into three nodes. We're going to write the second range into three nodes. And we write the, the third range into three nodes. Now we did this. We're doing some cool things. We're optimizing for storage. But this is also optimizing for compute. We're actually evening out, distributing the data so that we have this kind of distributed, basically evening out of, of everything that's going on in the database. And now if I if I fail something, I'm gonna be able to survive that, right? Um, we can also distribute data based on load. Um, so let's just say the middle range here. Muddy is a really awesome dog. That's that that was my dog. I'm sorry, but she's no line with us. Um, if Muddy was and everybody's everybody's interested, but that range is being accessed, it's called a hot range. So it's a part of a table that's really being accessed a whole lot. We can actually segment that out and have it reside in its own node somewhere so that we can actually optimize performance for compute. Um, but you can imagine, you know, with tables, this is a table with, you know, what is it, 12 records? We're talking thousands and millions of records, and it, it, this gets really, really complicated. We can actually optimize for where we place data across multiple nodes based on that. It's all automated, by the way. None of this has anything to do with anybody other than you do some alter table uh, commands that Keith's going to show you, and all this stuff kind of changes. But we can also do something that's really cool in terms of geo partitioning. We could actually take data and tie it to a location. We could have multiple different nodes in a system and say, hey, these nodes that live in Europe, I only want European data. Think about this for things like GDPR and compliance, right? It gets really interesting. More importantly, if you're gonna build a distributed database, you have to have something like geo partitioning because if a database is truly distributed, you're gonna have to deal with these latencies of access of data so that data is located closest to the user. Maybe it's leaseholders. There's lots of different things that we can do in the configuration of our database to, to allow us to actually help with that. And there we have, you know, oh gosh, tomes of, of good documentation that helps um, people go through this whole kind of how you actually think about this in, in, in your database. Now, you know, there's one thing deploying the database. And, and I think this is where there's a partnership between, you know, DevOps and SREs and admins and the developer itself and the DBAs and the way that people think about data. When you're deploying a distributed database, you kind of, you know, usually with a database, if it's a single instance of MySQL, I just think of the, the logical model. I, I think about the, the schema, what's, you know, how do I optimize that? Um, when you're deploying something that's distributed, you actually have to take into consideration the physical model as well, like where the data is physically going to reside, because you're going to optimize the database and how things are configured based for resiliency, what you want to survive, and latency. So we're always thinking about resiliency and latency when it comes to the topology and how we're actually going to go and implement a database, right? So real quickly, uh, we're also able to do things like rebalance things. So if you add a node to this system, the database is smart enough to just start moving these ranges around. So no more manual sharding, right? So what happens when you want to have, you know, a new instance of MySQL and you're doing sharding and you're in pods? Uh, the, it's so complex and the operators and all these things actually involved with it. This is one of the reasons why I think a lot of like traditional legacy databases are dependent on operators. We actually don't need operators to do this part of this. This is basically part and parcel of what we do. We don't, I mean, you know, what we need operators for in Kubernetes is like eh, some of the install stuff. And because we use stateful sets, actually, it, it, it actually helps us there. Um, you know, it can help us with storage, but from a management of the data and what's going on in that database, you know, traditional legacy database will rely heavily on, on an operator and, you know, and, and the whole framework that the Red Hat team has built out around our operators and, you know, the, the OpenShift team and Rob Zemisky and everything they're doing over there is this fantastic stuff about making it simple. Um, but you're still dependent on another piece of, of technology, whereas we're just basically really well aligned. Like 
This redistribution of data just is taken care of by the database. Pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Um, but we can do things like survive a, a permanent failure too. So remember server two going out and those three pods, well, what if one of those was part of the database? I just lost data if I'm in a traditional database. Well, with us, we already have you know replicas of that. We've already made sure that they're living on different nodes, which are the, you know, server two has some, maybe server three, maybe server five, right? Um, and we can basically just re-replicate that data. So we, we're always ensuring that there's gonna be three replicas of that data anywhere within the cluster. And we're guaranteeing that it's always going to be consistent. And yes, and not always available, but always consistent as well, right. which is really, really critical. And so we're going to show you some of that as well. So let's 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 go back to our let's go back to our cluster. All let's, right. let's make some things fail. Okay. Let's scale some stuff. So we can do that. Thanks. So you. I will show you that the the Oh, and by the, by the way, really quickly, by the way, if there's any questions during what we said and then what Keith's about to go to, please do enter, enter them into the QA panel as well. I just want to remind everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have an up and running uh, three node cluster. Um, um, we're, for the rest of this demonstration, we're going to use the, the pre-baked uh, cluster that, that I have. We're running, um, we're running across nine nodes um, in three different data centers. Um, Running these are we're running them in Google. It's three nodes in East, three nodes in Central, three nodes in West. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start um, actually loading some data into the cluster. Um, it'll take a minute or so. I'm running a couple of side containers just to just to generate. What, some what workload are you using for this one, Keith? We're using um, a Mover, which yeah. is our simulated rideshare app. Yeah. Um, that is uh, available in three cities for fake rides to wherever you'd like to go. <laughs> so um, our, our, our sample app. Our sample app, and, yeah. Yeah, so just as a, if anybody does want to do this sort of stuff, all that stuff is available in our Git repo. We also have TPCC uh, and that data available as well, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, excuse me. Um, so the, the great thing about all of our demonstrations is that they're all either baked into the binary, right? So um, uh, our workload um, simulator is, is baked in, allows you to do a lot of kind of consistent benchmarking across different platforms. Cool. Um, as well as we, all of these sample applications that we use for all of our demonstrations are open source and available and documented on our website. So so you don't have to believe that, uh, that this works the way I say it works. You can, you can go and try it out yourself. Um, so we're currently running some, um, uh, so some workload against a, a cluster. Um, while while that's going on, I'm going to go ahead and actually um, take down one of the pods. All right. So we're going to see here in a in a second that the one of these pods is is, is just going to kind of go away for for us. Um, while that's going on, you'll see that the the database is continuing to to, to load, load data, right? But we've got a, a node that, that's suspect. So a suspect node is, is a node that um, is no longer responding to the cluster in general, but we don't know if it's permanently gone. Um, the, uh, we have a configurable setting, by default it's set to five minutes, where we will assume that that node or pod in this case is not going to come back. And that's when we'll uh, start re-replicating those, those ranges to, to other nodes. Um, the reason that we do it this way is, um, yeah, it, particularly for things like rolling upgrades, where we're going to be restarting each of the pods in succession. Mm -hmm. We don't want to force a, like a redistribution of all the data in the cluster, but we also want to minimize that time where, where we could potentially be in a single point of failure. Um, you talked a little bit, Jim, uh, about how we do things in triplicate. That's the, the minimum that we recommend for a production cluster. Um, we, that is a configurable setting. So for, for a production environment where um, you want to be able to survive, say, more than one node or one pod or one location failure, you can change those that replication strategy to, to increase the number of replicas. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, restart that pod. Um, the magic of, of Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift is that uh, that pod's going to get rescheduled um, really quickly. There we go. All of a sudden, it's going to rejoin the cluster. And we're going to figure out where things need to be caught up, and we're going to catch that node back up to the to the rest of the environment. Um, this is something that is traditionally really difficult to do in uh, uh, in an environment where, say, you've got a, a active passive setup, right? Can you imagine having a database failure 
uh, in, with a legacy database where uh, your primary site went down, you failed over to your backup site, and you lost some data, and then your primary site came back, and now you've got to fail back over again. Yeah, but that never happens. Yeah, that never happens. <laughs> right. Yeah, that never happens. At Come all. on. Um, or, or something fails, and you're just on a webinar having a cup of tea, and it's really no big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so we're running uh, a decent amount of, uh, of work against this cluster, um, but our performance isn't all that great. Um, our P99 latency, which is 99% uh, of our queries, the, our, our worst case query right now is running like 600 milliseconds. That's, that's too long. That's way too long. But we didn't do any performance enhancements to tell the, the database uh, and the data about the structure of the data. and how it's being accessed. So we're gonna start making some optimizations there. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, to add some, some indexes and I'm going to partition the table. So um, what this is going to do is it's going to modify our um, the DDL for each of these tables in a way that's going to inform the database about where we want certain types of data to live. Okay. Okay. Um, this is not something you have to configure for each query. It's not something you have to configure for each record you insert in the database. It's a set of rules that you apply to the structure of the data um, that then the, the database handles for you in the background. Okay. So this process will will take take a minute or two. And what were you changing on that, Keith? What was uh... so so in this case we are um, we're changing the replication strategy so that uh, say the leaseholder that's the that's like the the, the um, king of the three the, the, yeah, yeah the, the, the master of the three replicas the, the, right um, for it to um, to be co-located with where that data is most likely to be accessed um, and we're also creating some indexes that will make it easier for us to to read that data so as so, you can, so let me ask you so just really quickly before yeah. how much do you have to think about these indexes before you actually implement and, and how do you how does that typically work within an organization as they do these sort of things yeah so so for us partition locality is a place yeah um now what that place is actually um it could be a physical place it could be a rack in a data center it's the name of a node it's the name of a server right yeah the name of a server um, we're just setting up some high level guidance to tell the cluster how to self optimize sure um, so if we go ahead and we look at some of the, the instructions for some of these uh, tables, um, you can see yeah. that we created a couple of indexes and we partitioned these indexes. So we're mapping, say, a city to, to a region. Okay, so in this instance, basically, we're taking attributes for city. Yep. And write a city, and we're basically saying everything with values that are New York, everything with values in Chicago. Everything values in Seattle, we're assigning those to particular nodes. And it's simple as basically an alter table command within, the, and, and can, you, can you change this on the fly too? I, maybe you're going to get to that. Yeah, so um, I don't have this implemented in the demonstration okay. today, but um, one of the, the more advanced patterns is to um, set a constraint that, um, that makes the primary region for a particular record the region where it was inserted into the database. So, so let's just say we're New York, Chicago, and Seattle. You have three nodes, they're located in these three areas. So we make sure that data is gonna be located one or the other, right? And so we're getting low latency access in that region. Say we spin up Atlanta. So to be clear, the data lives in all of the regions. Ah, cool. Okay, but what we're talking about here is, is optimizing for access patterns. Ah, right. So because we're trying to equalize latency across different data centers, um, we're doing things like, um, Building covering indexes to make it uh, to make local read access faster. In, in that regard, we're going to give up a little bit on write performance. Right. So uh, we can optimize for read performance. We can optimize for write performance, or we can optimize for kind of a blend of both of those things. That's cool. So this is one of those areas where we got to actually really think through, like, what do we want to accomplish? What do we have in the data, and then. Absolutely. optimizing the database for that so um the first set of optimizations that i applied to the cluster was a balanced set of optimizations so we want to make it easy to read the data from the region that it, it, we expect it to be in um, and we want to distribute our replicas in a way that if we're to lose an entire region let's say us east one were to go away mm -hmm. our um our new york users would be 
picked up by the next nearest region, which in right. my case would be Chicago. Cool. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the promo codes, which are um, which are a global table. So the ride tables, those are those are that's a partitioned. Table. Yeah. Rides are going to happen in a region anyway. Right. So rides are going to be tied to a city. You, you're not going to you're not going to take a ride share from directly from New York to Chicago, and most most likely unless you're be pretty pricey. Yeah, it'd be really pricey. But you might want to use the same promo code that you used at home when you landed, uh, you know, Chicago or Harry Airport. Want, you might want to avoid surge pricing too. Uh, yeah, you absolutely. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to to make a global table out of the promo codes, and that's going to to demonstrate. Um, even better performance because what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that you get super fast reads on those promo codes. Um, you can imagine they don't. You're not going to add a promo code like not too often. Yeah. Every 10 milliseconds. Yeah. Um, so taking a bit of a right hit on the promo code is not that big a deal, but we need to optimize for reads. But even the right hit is going to be pretty minuscule in that. Too, it'll right? be um, it's like 100 milliseconds or. It'll be um, instead of two times the round trip between um, your your furthest nodes. I think it's four times. Yeah. We're going to have covering indexes. There. Interesting. Okay. So um, so which in our case um, your your right performance hit would be somewhere in the 150 millisecond range, but your read performance is going to be sub 10 milliseconds. So okay. even without doing this, we got the the overall application down to a. Mm -hmm. um, a roughly 40 millisecond um, P99 query time. Uh, that means that you could um, run a real-time app without someone feeling lag on their phone uh, using CockroachDB just with the partitioning that I've already done. Right. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to, to push that way down by making sure that our coupon, co coupon codes are available everywhere. Um, one of the things you saw real quick is our performance got a little worse. For a second, yeah, a little better. blip. Right. Um, so, and that's because we um, we were building some indexes on the background where we're starting to move some data. Interesting. Um, now, generally speaking, we're gonna you're gonna set these rules up well before users are using these applications. Um, but if we were to simulate a failure here right now, we would potentially see a bit of a performance um, blip as well. Um, the important part is that I didn't have to restart my load app when we killed that pod earlier and restarted it. Everything just kept going. And you didn't have to restart anything when you started to change the way that these tables worked one by one. Absolutely. Right. So, so what, what did the script look like that you just changed, Keith? So it was just a, a handful of alter table statements. It was actually on the promo codes table. Well, let's go ahead and let yeah, let's look at it. finish uh, reloading. It was three alter table statements. We're creating, we created an alter table to, to um, pin the primary locations for the promo codes to the central region. Um, and then we created two covering indexes, one for the east region, one for the west region. And we did that specifically to, to normalize our, um, our latency across all of the regions in the United States. Right, so in this particular instance, you just figured that, well, Chicago is kind of in the middle of everything. We'll, we'll make that as the head and then basically cut, create covering indexes in the coasts. Yes, and so this could survive any single but it's, complete yeah. data center failure. Um, if we uh, wanted to move that central region from Chicago to say Austin, Texas, we could even potentially survive the loss of an entire like uh, power grid on the eastern or east or west coast. Of course, Texas has their own power grid. Texas is Kind of one of their own thing. Texas, 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 Texas. Right. So thank you for being in Texas. Anybody from um, Texas? So um, our performance just went from roughly 40 milliseconds to our worst case. Our worst case. P90, queries, worst case. Worst case queries are running at roughly 12 milliseconds. If we were to go and look at our um, our 90th percentile queries, nine out of every 10 queries on every node in the cluster is running under two milliseconds. Across the entire country. Across the entire country with three different application servers in this case interacting from three different data centers. That's fantastic. That's right. And so now I have data living across the entire country. I have low latency accessing under two milliseconds, P9 and P, Jesus, that's, that's really good. And you're gonna survive the failure of what? One region, two regions? In this case, the way this is set up, we can survive any 
um, any node failing or any region failing, and the application will continue to run. Right, without significant impact to performance. So there would be some performance impact, but um, you would still have complete service available. Okay, cool. Yeah. How does this work when you start going across oceans and that sort of stuff, Pete? Well, so that is where you have to start really thinking long and hard about what your user's usage patterns are. Right. Unfortunately, we haven't invented quantum network cards yet. We still are bound by the speed of light. Um, but what we can do is we can normalize our latency. If we have enough locations, we can normalize our latency across uh, a globally consistent cluster. Right. Now that doesn't mean that a replica of every record lives in every region. Right. Yeah. It doesn't mean that uh, all of your EMEA data is going to live in the U.S. or vice versa. What it means is that you have both um, you have local fast reads and writes, and during certain failure scenarios, you have the option of, of kind of setting up what your recovery right. strategies are. So in EMEA with uh, GDPR, you may be limited to your EMEA records staying in data centers in, in Europe, in, um, in the European Union, cool. right? But in the United States, we just want the primary um, replicas yeah. to be in the United States. Um, but potentially we might, in a failure scenario, let's say, um, let's say uh, U.S. Central One goes down, maybe uh, maybe our backup uh, location for there would be uh, one of the Canada regions yeah. in GCP or, or Amazon, right? Uh, because we don't have quite the same uh, data domiciling issues right. as you do in EMEA. Um, it's it's not a matter of um, necessarily wanting to have all of your data everywhere all the time it's a matter of being having one centralized unified view of your data right. so that you're not having to re-implement your application for each yeah. each country you happen to be in or if a user like let's say i'm uh i'm uh i'm uh traveling from new york to, to london i don't want to have to sign up for a new account on mover london right, right? i want my account information and all that stuff to, to go with and it comes back to basically every new node being an endpoint, right? And every node having access to the entirety of the database. Like, no matter where these nodes live or the, you know, across a cluster, it, it just looks like one big database, and the underlying infrastructure actually deals with all that. So when a pod fails, it brings it back up, just like Kubernetes, and we get this resilience, right? Talk to me a little bit about, you know, I think one of the values of, of especially with Red Hat OpenShift, and I think why a lot of people turn to that product in particular is like, yeah, there's Kubernetes, but there's also kind of minimizing the risk and, and simplifying the concept of hybrid implementations as well. And so just, just talk to me a little bit about like those situations as well. We had a conversation that come, came through actually right around this around hybrid and hybrid data center and, and domiciling of data, I believe. And, you know, how do we control where data is replicated in multiple regions, right? Yeah. So, so from our perspective, a node is a node is a node. We need to know that node needs to declare where it um, where where it needs to exist in the topology of the cluster. Um, but any node, as long as they can talk to all the other nodes in the database cluster, right. um, can join from anywhere. That means that you don't necessarily have to have some sort of a like federated Kubernetes cluster. You don't have to have all of your um, uh, you don't have to have all of your pods in the same region or even in the same cloud provider. You can have um, some private cloud nodes running on um, uh, on like OpenStack um, with OpenShift on top, uh, and as well as some nodes right. running um, in GCP and in so it's truly multi-cloud, like multi multiple public clouds, and, right. and maybe private with OpenShift or whatever you're doing in in, in or. I'm sorry, OpenStack, I messed it up. The, the only limitation that we would have is that any uh, to, for a node to join the cluster, it needs to be able to talk to all the other nodes in the cluster. Yeah. Um, we can do that securely over TLS, uh, over the open internet for, for certain use cases. Um, otherwise, we'd want to have some sort of a VPN or VPC type peering between our environments yeah. just to provide secure um, connectivity between them. Yeah, so typically, I mean, I, I don't know how many truly federated Kubernetes clusters have you heard of in the wild? 
Uh, not that many. Yeah, not not a whole lot. It's really difficult to do the networking, the security. I, it's just very complicated. I think we're we're getting there. I think there's some companies that are solving some of those very hard issues, right? So while your Kubernetes deployments aren't connected sometimes, right? You just have a different Kubernetes cluster in every region or every data center, whatever you want. Yet you're still running a database that is connected. Is that is that is that how that looks? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So um, there were a couple other questions here. Uh, we have some time left. Um, uh, and this is a good one. So, how does CockroachDB compare against a uh, traditional relational data store? Let's just say, like an Oracle, something like that, from a performance point of view, right? This looks pretty complicated. There's a lot going on. What what is the, what's the impact on performance? All so, so a traditional database, um, particularly if you want to be able to guarantee consistency for reads and writes, is a scale up architecture. That means if you need to be able to support more data or more transactions per second, you need to do you need a bigger server to run that database. That is universally true pretty much across all of the, the legacy um, database providers, or yeah. DNS providers. Yeah. We're a scale out platform. What that means is if you need to be able to add more capacity, either for transactions per second or for um, raw data storage, rather than having to go and replace the, the nodes you already have, you just add more nodes to the cluster. Right. Um, that's kind of the fundamental difference between how we're architected from a traditional RDBMS. And you just add without having the manual sharding and all the other chaos. You know, right? yeah, exactly. We're handling right. all of that stuff on the back. Right, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So it's basically, you get comparable performance. So what does that mean then from a cost point of view, right? Like, so if you think about that, I, it, typically the, the next question is like, that's great, I just scale out, but I'm adding more and more compute, more and more, right? What, what does that look like from a cost point of view in that, that type of situation? Well, so I, you know, I can't speak specifically as far as cost because there's always so many variables there. Yeah. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind is that there's a there's a point of diminishing returns with a traditional RDBMS where you're you're buying huge big iron boxes like those big like full rack IBM P series machines and whatnot that are seven figures rolling out the door before you've even turned on half the processors, right? Um, that's not what we're installing. We're installed on commodity servers. The vast majority of them are running, you know, eight to 16 vCPUs, 32 to 64 gigs of memory. Right. Um, those are those are not super expensive servers to procure. Whether you're you're operating them in your own physical data center um, and you've got pizza boxes, or you're running in a virtualized environment like um, OpenStack. Or if you're in a cloud provider like Google or AWS, those right. are those are pretty economical machines for for you to procure. Um, so you have predictable cost increases to get your same performance increase. Whereas at a certain point with a traditional system, um, adding additional transactions or adding additional storage, your cost curve kind of can hockey stick up. Right. So so I think we've we've as an industry we're all kind of getting used to that, and over the past couple of years. You know, we saw the introduction of NoSQL databases as well. I know you're very familiar with things like Cassandra. Yep. There's some others that are out there. You know, how is this different from those? So we kind of take that scale out um, capability from the NoSQL ecosystem and add strong transaction and SQL support. So um, that means that we guarantee consistency. Um, if a transaction is committed to the database, we guarantee that um, we will always return the the most recent result, unlike most NoSQL environments, mm -hmm. uh, we guarantee a strong transaction, multi-stage transaction support, um, and that we serializably isolate those transactions. And that that's not something that uh, people pay that much attention to. Most RDBMSs are not serializably isolated. They use something called snapshot isolation, which is a slightly weaker form of isolation. Um, it's not really a problem in something like a traditional Postgres or DB2 or Oracle environment because it's only a single server. So the the, the window of time where multiple transactions could collide in a in a bad way or be measured in single digit microseconds, right? Even milliseconds, like right. thousands of a, of a millisecond. But because we're distributed and we're um, we potentially can have a transaction that's hitting servers in three different data centers, we have to we have to pay attention to um, what the impact of conflicting transactions would be 
um, in like uh, milliseconds or maybe even full seconds in a certain scenario. Right. Um, which means that it's really important for us to be as strongly isolated as possible. Yeah. Um, and because we're scale out, we can get the same performance that you can get with a slightly less isolated environment in a traditional RDBMS. Right. Um, while uh, while still getting that strongest guarantee uh, that your transactions won't ever conflict. Right. Which is I, somebody's asking this. I think as you were talking to, it's like so. What what is the what's the impact on write latency of you know globally distributed database right yeah. and so and i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna seed you with something as well and you know we th start thinking about cbo and those sort of things some of the, the tricks that we've done yeah what what are some of the things we've done to address the, the, the you know these long write latencies yeah so um so first off um we are going to by default distribute the data in the most highly resilient pattern right. that's available to the cluster based on whatever your top level of partitioning is that's not necessarily the most performant configuration which is why um, we provide the ability for um for a dba or a developer to um tell us what the shape of that data looks like so that we can apply it more appropriately to the topology right um we have things like cost-based optimization. Um, we have a, we've added a concept to RAF called leaseholder that gives us a, a effectively a coordinating replica uh, right. that uh, allows us to do things like fast, uh, faster reads um, when they're not conflicting transactions going on. Um, we have something called follower reads, yeah. which will allow you to do time travel queries if you um, if you if you want to read from your uh, local replica of the data and you're okay if it's five seconds stale, um, uh, that's a that's an option that's available to you. Right. Um, but the the big thing that, that we like folks to keep in mind um, is that it's it's not the Faustian bargain like you had with the traditional RDBMS where you've got these read only snapshots that are available everywhere and the further your snapshot is away the the, the more out of date it is, right? Um, if you need fast reads and you need fast writes, we have a solution for that. It's just a question of um, optimizing for those uh, for those scenarios. Right. Um, and and what the one last thing that, that we we encourage you to do is making sure that your your individual regions are close enough together that we can develop a quorum for any given transaction. That's the that's the real key yeah. to to a globally distributed. Data. Yeah, it, it's one of the reasons I was attracted to working here is some of the problems that we're solving are truly unique. Um, you know, our battle isn't with, you know, performance results X, Y, and Z. Our battle was with the speed of light. Right. Um, you know, when we look at things and the way that we think about what we want to get from a performance point of view for both read and write, it, it is the speed of light. And so some of the stuff we did around parallel commits recently is another one of those things where there's some there's some computer science going into this thing that uh, computer engineering I might as well just say right that that is just really phenomenal that is allowing people to get the best of both worlds like it's not just you know your great read great you know low rights no you you can you can possibly have incredibly great access and or incredibly great performance and resiliency um, for for both reads and writes so one last question Keith before I go uh, there's a couple more that come through but let me just um, are there certain types of workloads that are better suited for CRDB, for CockroachDB? Um, yes. And, so, and there's some of that that aren't, right? So, so we are focused on OLTP transactional workloads. We are not focused on analytics workloads. Right. That's not to say that you can't do certain analytics queries on our platform, but we are focused on the system of record, transaction journal, um, accounting journal, types of use cases that, that um, um, financial businesses might be in, interested in, logistics companies, um, things that, uh, that are interacting with a, a directly with the user. Um, we have some great partnerships with, uh, with other database vendors around the, the analytics space. Um, I suspect that over the, the next few years, we're, we're gonna start to move more towards that you know, hybrid um, transactional analytic processing type of environment, but but right now we're we're very much focused on on those OLTP workloads where applications are going to be connecting directly to the database yeah. and you're running multiple you know 
thousands or tens of thousands of transactions per second. And all types of them. I mean, I think, you know, traditionally we were seeing things like, you know, I think one of our biggest uh, case studies we run is the Kindred Group over in, over in Europe, and they're doing a betting application, and right. it's global, right? And so the book, the money, is actually run on Cockroach, right? Like, and that's a, that's a financial ledger. Well, you can imagine that they, um, they need it to be globally consistent because they don't want somebody betting the same dollar more than once. Right, exactly. Yeah, and so that's a financial ledger. But we're starting to see the emergence of people using this for smaller, quicker applications too, right? I mean, like anything. I mean, you get the you get the value of like this. You no longer have to like as a developer, you don't have to do a sharding. You don't have to worry about all this like active passive resilience stuff. The database is just so there's there's value in these less kind of strict OLTP engagements as well, right? Yeah. So so a lot of folks that, that we talk to, they're very much concerned about being being able to sur uh, survive the hockey stick moment for their for their business. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, particularly uh, companies that we've been talking to out on the West Coast, um, they're, they're hoping that all of a sudden they they capture that zeitgeist right. and they go from hundreds or thousands of users yeah. to millions of users overnight. Um, we're a database that solves for that problem under the covers without them really having to think about doing anything other than scaling yep. out the database. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine what you would do if you had based your 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 platform on a legacy environment and weren't able to to meet those those scale yeah. scale requirements. Yeah. So cool. Um, we had a couple more questions here. Uh, that's actually an old thank you, so I'm just going to leave it here. Uh, we had a couple more questions there. We are out of time, however. Um, so I did want to actually just thank thank you, Keith, for that it was a great conversation as always, buddy. Um, and I wanted to thank our hosts. Uh, uh, Red Hat for having us on this today and the DevOps, the comm team as well. So Charlene, did you want to bring us mm -hmm. home? Uh, yeah, sure. I do want to um, kind of put the invite out to everybody. If you're going to be out at KubeCon, please uh, go ahead and uh, stop by and uh, say hello to the folks over at Cockroach Labs. They're going to be there. Um, or and uh, also uh, Red Hat. So uh, if you're going to be down Amsterdam way, um, just uh, swing on by and say hello. Um, also, uh, maybe you guys want to let folks know what to do if they want to find out more, how, how they can get engaged with Cockroach. Well, as with everything these days, you head on out to the great Google machine. No, you <laughs> head over to cockroachlabs.com. Um, we have tons of information there. Uh, you can get started today with 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 what we're doing. Um, this is open source, you can download and start using today. Again, um, you can start using this with OpenShift as well, and it's as really as simple as a couple different clicks as well, um, you know, from a Red Hat point of view as well. Um, our documentation is phenomenal. I've never heard anything else but that as a, as a response when people use it. Um, you can learn a lot there. We have lots of webinars if you wanted a deeper dive into the architecture. Um, all that is available at cockroachlabs.com. Um, and, and again, we're just thankful that we're here to, to participate in this. So thank you very much, awesome. Charlie. Yeah, All thanks. right. All right. Great. Well, before we close things out, I did promise at the top of the hour that we would be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Our first winner today is uh, Drew H. Congratulations, Drew. Second winner today is Jen M. Congratulations, Jen. And our third and final winner today is Peter T. Congratulations, Peter. We're going to follow up after today's webinar with an email to all three of you, just uh, letting you know uh, the next steps for getting that gift card to you. So um, please uh, check your email for that. Also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out an email following today's webinar that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go find it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Also want to thank the audience, uh, especially those who uh, submitted questions. And uh, those, uh, all those questions will be going over to the folks at Cockroach Lab. So if we didn't get an answer to your question during today's webinar, I'm sure somebody from the organization will be following up with you. So uh, Keith, Jim, please, thank you so much uh, for such a great uh, presentation today. We really uh, you know, lo love to see the demos, love to hear the conversations. So thanks so much for imparting such great information.
Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. I want to thank the audience again for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.